and it's lovely. Thank you, ladies. It took all I had just to sit there and not get up here and take this mic and start singing with the ladies, but <laughs> one of these days I'm going to surprise them. They're, they're not going to know, but uh, if you have your Bibles, if you would turn to John 17. Today on the calendar of uh, the Christian calendar is Ascension Sunday, so as we think about uh, following the, the gospel lessons, uh, this is the Sunday where we remember uh, that Jesus ascended back to heaven, uh, back to his Father, and as he did, he left his disciples with a mission to go out into the world and to make more disciples. And uh, so this is a passage in John 17, we'll begin reading in at verse 6 in just a minute, that is not a story about how the ascension happened, it's rather a a prayer of Jesus where we get to look into the heart of Jesus and see and really feel the emotions that he's going through not only just because he's about to be crucified but because he knows that his time on earth with with his disciples is coming to an end and so as we read this section of scripture I want you to put yourself in the place of Jesus and hear the emotions if you were Jesus praying for your disciples what would you have said and if you were Jesus' disciple back then and you got to hear just a glimpse of this prayer, how would you have felt? And so today we can hear this prayer. This is Jesus praying for you and praying for me. What a beautiful sentiment. So John chapter 17, beginning in verse 6. This is Jesus praying. Praying to his Father. He says, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words that you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given to me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name the name that you gave me so that they may be as one as we are one while I was with them I protected them and kept them safe by that name that you gave me none has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled I am coming to you now but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world, any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. I have printed out an insert. I think, did anyone get that little sermon insert? The Ascent. In this is the first time I've made one of those in five years here. Most of my sermons are try to keep to uh, a primary point, and I wanted to break down this prayer in John 17 to the four really key elements that I see Jesus praying for his disciples about. So I invite you, if you have one of those inserts, sermon inserts, if you have a pen and you want to kind of fill that out, and this will be something for you to remind yourself of this week and the weeks to come, and think about this prayer that Jesus prayed over you you and I just as he prayed over his disciples back then. In the Apostles' Creed, one of the lines that we say towards the end is that we affirm that Jesus ascended into heaven and then sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And in saying this and in affirming this, it's not so much a, a statement of where Jesus is, it's more of a statement of uh, 
basically his, his position, his authority, um, any kind of time that, especially in talking religion, temple talk, uh, kingdom talk, when he talked about a king having someone sitting at his right hand, it basically meant that person sitting as a, at his right hand was kind of uh, in charge just as the king would be in charge, would have full authority. And so the idea when we affirm that Jesus ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, we are saying that he has all authority in heaven and on earth. And he has authority over us as his disciples. And so as Jesus sent his disciples out into the world, he didn't send them out with nothing. He said, I've been given all authority, and so I, I give you all that power, all the authority that you are going to need to then go into the world and make disciples. So this Ascension Sunday, reading this prayer of Jesus... As things are winding down for his earthly ministry, this is a prayer that reveals the heart of Jesus as he knows that his time on earth is coming to an end. And as I read this prayer this past week, it made me think of some of the most impactful prayers that were prayed over me by people in my life. Maybe you have similar instances. And thinking about Mother's Day, there's a song that Randy Travis sings about mothers. It's called Angels. And in talking about angels... Randy Travis isn't talking about heavenly winged creatures with harps and talking about angels. Randy Travis is talking about his mother. He's talking about mothers. And one of the lines in there is talking about how the mother, his mother, would stay up when he was out. And she would leave the light on. And she would stay up praying for him until he came in home safely. That's an impactful prayer for, from a mother for her son or her daughter. I think about growing up and the moments in my life where I was coming to the end of an era or starting a new adventure, such as high school graduation. We got high school graduations coming up here pretty soon. And thinking about that very impactful moment for a parent praying over their child. I'll never forget my dad coming to me and praying for me the day of my graduation, laying hands on me and praying God's blessings. Praying that as, as I was moving on from high school, that God would use my life. That whatever college I went to, I was in the military, whatever path my life took, that God would use me to uh, share his glory in the world. I remember my prayer before going to military training, going to basic training. I was so nervous. I didn't know what was coming ahead. All I knew, it was going to be a rough nine weeks. And I remember my dad coming to me again laying his hands on me and praying over me, repeating Psalm 91 over my life. That was a very impactful prayer in my life. I remember at my ordination, when I was set apart for the task of going into the church and preaching and ministering, it was actually the day before Rebecca and I got married. And I remember having a group of men and my family and friends gathered around me at the altar as I kneeled down and they anointed me with oil and they prayed over me that God would continue to use my life and that God would use me to go into the church and to preach his word and to, to see lives changed through the ministry of the gospel. These are moments that set my life in all new trajectories. These are moments in life where I felt God's grace in a whole new way. Remember the day that I got married to Rebecca, having my groomsmen gather around me and lay their hands on me and pray over me, that I would be a good husband, that I would love Rebecca as Christ loved the church. I wonder as you sit here today and you think about moments of your life of maybe coming to the end of an era or starting something new and having somebody in your life, whether it was a mother, whether it was a father, maybe it was a friend, maybe it was a pastor, pray over you, lay hands on you, anoint you with oil, whatever it might be, but just to know that there was somebody praying for you. It's a powerful thing for us, and it can change our lives. I'm reading a book by an author named Bob Goff. Some of you have read some of his books, and his newest book is called Everybody Always. And I ran across this quote this week from Bob Goff. He says, instead of telling people what they want, we need to tell them who they are. This works every time. We will become in our lives whoever the people we love the most say that we are. Hear that again. He says, we will become in our lives whoever the people we love the most say that we are. 
And so having words of affirmation and prayers from family members, from mothers, from fathers, from grandparents, from pastors, from ministry leaders, whatever it is, those are the moments that can change and impact our lives for eternity. And so as we think about Jesus' prayer, I wonder what does Jesus say that we are? What does Jesus want us to be in this world? How does he want us to live? And so I broke down Jesus' prayer into these four simple desires for Jesus from us. And so the first thing that Jesus prays over us in this prayer is that we might be, that we might be one. Now, as we think about this idea of being one, what specifically is Jesus praying about? If you go to verse 1 of John chapter 17, this is what Jesus says. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and he prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. The whole context of Jesus' ministry and his life was knowing this one thing, that he and the Father were one. That any time Jesus spoke, he was speaking his Father's words. Any time that he healed somebody, he was healing someone in the Father's name and in the Father's will. Any time he forgave someone of their sins, he was doing so on behalf of his heavenly Father. Jesus did nothing apart from his Father's will and his Father's blessing. And so when Jesus prays that you and I, that, that his disciples, that his church would be one, it's not this mystical thing that's just going to happen by itself. It's this relationship built on mutual submission to one another. That's what Jesus was praying for his church, is that we would be in a relationship with others where we put others before ourselves and we make a concerted effort to live in peace and harmony together. As we think about this idea of being one, think about all of the things in our culture where it requires somebody and it requires a group of people to become one to be successful. I'm a, I'm a big sports fan. I like watching uh, football and baseball and basketball and, and all of these sports. Oftentimes we focus on the all-stars. We, all, we, we focus on our favorite players, the ones who score the most points, the one who gets the, mo get the most minutes. But as I think about one of my favorite teams, I'm, I wasn't really a, a bandwagon fan. I just liked watching Michael Jordan play. And I loved watching the Bulls, even though I, you know, there were times where I loved to hate them and I didn't want to see them win as many championships as they did. But if you take Michael Jordan and you think about the instance of him playing on the Chicago Bulls, he was one of the best players to ever play the game. But if you think about his cast of, of players surrounding him. Each one had a job that they had to do. And if one person rose to the spotlight and said, this team is all about me, it's all about my fame, it's all about my glory, Michael Jordan and the Bulls wouldn't have been as successful as they were. Even as good as Michael Jordan was, he knew that it took five players to do the work together in order to be successful. I think about our church choir here at Bastrop Christian Church. It's a wonderful ministry of a collection of individuals that over the years has grown. When I first got here, there was, uh, it depends on whether the Lathams were with us, but there were times where it was myself and Jim, and while Joseph would be leading us, he would be singing one of the bass lines because we just needed enough men. And, and so now as the choir has grown, you know, we enjoy our practices, and there are times where I get a little out of control during practice, and I like to sing my part with gusto, and I like to kind of sing above everybody else, and I, I like to kind of act like, oh, you know, just kind of this vibrato kind of thing. And, and Joseph, I mean, he knows when I'm just playing around, but there's times where I'm not trying to do that, but I, I'm actually doing that. There's times where I know my part so well that I'm singing out above everybody else. Or there's others that are singing above other people. And so one of the things they has to bring us back to is that there's four parts in this thing, guys. Guys and ladies, there's four parts to this, and we all have to blend our voices in a way that it sounds like one sheet of music. And so there are times where he's trying to remind us of that we're not listening to him, and he tells us to gather in a circle and look at each other. And so we're not standing facing out, but we're, we're kind of facing each other in a circle, and he says, sing towards the middle is what he says sing towards the middle. We're hearing the other parts and we're hearing how our part fits into the whole. 
And so it's this idea of mutual submission to one another that, yes, my part is important, but so are the others that are in the choir. And it's important that as we sing, that we sing together to make one piece of music. I think about marriage as another example of the importance of being one. When we talk about husbands and wives becoming one flesh, that's where the rubber meets the road, and that's oftentimes where there is dissension. That is the hard part for us in marriages, is learning how to back off a little bit, to back off my stubbornness, to back off always having to have my way and to put the needs of Rebecca in front of myself. Marriage, two flesh becoming one flesh. Jesus prayed that his church, that his disciples would be one. And it's not an easy thing. It takes work. It takes practice. It takes humility. It takes submission to one another. The second thing that Jesus prays for us in his prayer is that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. That they may have the full measure of my joy within them. There's the verse from Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10. And of course you know it. The joy of the Lord is my... The Lord... Man. The joy of the Lord is my... The joy of the Lord is my... All right. There we go. That is a passage that, if you look at the context, Nehemiah the prophet and Ezra the priest had just found the law of God that was hidden for many years. It was hidden and the people didn't know their own story. They didn't know the law of God. And so Ezra brings out the law of God and he begins to read it to the people for the first time in years. And the people were Mourning, and they were, they were sad because they hadn't heard these words in their lifetime. And they're now all of a sudden hearing these words from God to them that shaped them as a people. And in the midst of the mourning and their crying, Nehemiah says to them, Don't weep, for right now is a time of celebration. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Is your strength. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You guys are on it. This is good. Joy is, is not a fake or manufactured happiness. It's not you just saying, I've got the joy, 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 joy down it. Joy is not putting on a smile when you don't feel like it. Joy is letting the life of Christ live through you and breathe through you in all circumstances of life. Jesus here is speaking about joy even as he's getting ready to endure the cross. Isn't that something? He's getting ready to endure the cross. And he's praying that his disciples would have the full measure of joy, of his joy within them. And then Jesus goes on to say in, within that prayer that I've given them your word. And he's saying, you are going to be hated for standing upon the word and the truth of God. But even while being hated, even while being persecuted... He says, I want you to have my full joy. That when you go out into the world and you make disciples and you set free the captives and you work towards healing of the sick and the, and, and the diseased in your world, that as, as you are on mission for Christ in this world and you receive setbacks, that it's going to be the joy of Christ that propels you to go beyond the tough days. That even in the midst of persecution, you can say, I'm going to keep going on. And it's going to be because the joy of Christ is there within you, the full measure of joy. Listen to Jesus' words in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. He says, rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in me, the same way that, that they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted. And so how we react when trials come our way. How we react when persecution and insults and threats come along our path is a good indicator of whether Christ's joy 
is within us. But that's what he prayed for you and for me. The third point of the prayer is Jesus says, don't take them out of the world, but protect them from the evil one. <laughs> uh, don't, what? No, Jesus, no, take us out of the world. Wait, I'll fly away, oh glory. No, don't take them out of the world, but protect them from the evil one. Now, of course, there is going to be a moment when I die that, yes, I will fly away. I don't know how that's going to look. I don't know how that's going to work. But until that moment comes, our eyes aren't to be up. Our eyes are to be out. Don't take them out of the world. Protect them from the evil one. We are reminded that as Jesus prays that, that, that the Father keeps us in the world, that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But it's against the rulers, against the authorities, the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. From this point of Jesus' prayer, we are reminded that Christianity's primary focus is not about you and I flying away. It's about a loving God who loved the world and came into that world. It's about that same God sending us into the world as his body to carry out the ministry that he began. There is an ancient Hebrew word that says, Takun Olam. And this is a word that means to repair the world. The ancient Hebrews used this phrase, this word, Takun Olam, to speak about the mission of us as humans on the earth to go about repairing the world. But oftentimes, as we go about our mission in this world, it's so easy to be jaded and say there's too many things to work on. There's too many things to fix. The problems are too great. But yet, we are called to be about tukun olam, of repairing the world, of going to the sick, of going to the poor, of going to the outcast, of going to the foreigner, of standing up for the powerless and the voiceless, and doing what we can in this world while time is still at hand. To go out into our world and to fix what we can, to heal what we can, to spread joy, to spread love, to spread grace, and to spread truth. Jesus says, don't take them out of the world. They have a job to do in the world but protect them from the evil one. And the evil one is not your neighbors. The evil one isn't the ones that are hard to love. The evil ones are not flesh and blood, my friends. Keep them in the world so that we might rub off salt and light onto our neighbors. The fourth, fourth point of Jesus' prayer, and the last that I want to point out, is Jesus praying that we would be sanctified by the truth. That we would be sanctified. Now, the word sanctify or sanctification is a kind of a Christian theological buzzword that even I sometimes, we, we, we say, but we don't understand the full meaning of. I provided the, the Greek wording there in that insert for you. And the Greek word for sanctific sanctification or sanctify is hagiatso. And it basically means to set something apart means to consecrate something, to dedicate something for a specific purpose. To cleanse or to purify or to make something holy. Now, one of the words that we use to describe this space that we are in today is a word called sanctuary. And it's a word that sometimes kind of sounds ominous. It's a word that as I think about growing up in the church, I wasn't allowed to run in the sanctuary. You can run out in the foyer, you can run in the church basement, you can run upstairs, but do not run in the sanctuary. Anyone else got told not to run in the sanctuary? The sanctuary is basically a word that means this space has been set apart for a specific purpose. That we humans have seen fit to build this space and to put in the, the windows and the, the beautiful carvings of the sun rays coming down over there. And as I look back, the carving of the cross. 
As we look around this beautiful building, it tells us that this is a space that has been set apart for something different. That we leave our work and we leave our, our homes and we leave mundane life and we come in this set apart place to do something special, to partake in something that can change our lives if we allow it. This place is sanctuary and it's not that it's any more holy than any other place, but it's that we have set it apart for this specific function of fellowship and worship and meeting together with the risen and the ascended Christ. Christians all over the world are meeting in set-apart places for worship. And they're meeting in beautiful, ornate cathedrals. They're meeting in buildings kind of like this. They're meeting in school cafeterias. Anyone like their school food growing up? I don't, I, was, I, was, I don't know if I'd be able to do that. They're meeting in movie theaters. They're moving in parks. They're, they're meeting in homes. They're meeting in prisons. They're meeting outdoors. They've set apart spaces for worship that are like this and so vastly different. Christians all over the world have stained glass windows. They have wood carvings. They have pews. They have benches. They sit on the ground. They have sound systems and instruments. Some sing a cappella. They have projection systems. They have hymnals. They have sheets of music or they sing songs all by memorization. But these places have been sanctified just as Christ prayed that we would be sanctified. That you and I would be set apart people called out to come out of our sin, come out of our darkness, and come towards his light collectively in this place, that the risen and ascended Christ would pour his grace into our lives and he would change us. And friends, as we dedicate ourselves to this, meeting in sanctuary together, as we submit ourselves to this journey of being a living sanctuary for Christ in this world, of being set apart as temples of the Holy Spirit, we are sent into the world in the manner of the one who came and ascended. Just yesterday, this is my closing story here, yesterday, well, I guess it was Friday, I was in the office working on my message, and uh, we get a lot of people that come whether they're visitors or townies that uh, will stop by the church and they'll take pictures of the church and they'll walk through the garden. And as I got up to get a drink of water, I heard a couple out in the garden and they were talking and they were talking quite loudly. It sounded like there was an argument going on outside. And so I, I spied on them, I'll be honest. I went and stood at the <laughs> kitchen window and as I looked out, I saw they weren't arguing, they were shrieking with joy as they were looking around the garden, looking at the carved cross, looking at all the flowers, looking at all of the different special touches that have been put in our garden. And I kept hearing the wife, she was dragging her husband along, saying, look at this, and look at this, and look at this. She kept saying, look at this. What a beautiful garden. And as I, as I heard that, uh, I remembered the story of, of that garden, that it was set apart to be, of sorts, an outdoor sanctuary. That there would be moments where this sanctuary would be locked, and for people to be able to find sanctuary even out there. To find the presence of God, to find reminders of God's grace and his love and his truth. And as I thought about how joyous that couple was out there to discover these things in the sanctuary, it made me think that maybe that could be you and I. That we could be that living sanctuary. That when people come across our path, they're filled with joy. That they're filled with awe and wonder of how good God is because they see how good God is in your life. Maybe we could be those kinds of living sanctuaries in our world, that we would be set apart for Christ. Friends, my prayer is that our lives would reflect the goodness, the beauty, the love, and the grace, and the truth of our risen and ascended Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. John, can I call an audible on the song? Maybe. You can probably guess what song I'd like to sing. Is it okay, Vicky, if I change the song? 655. Yeah, you're already thinking about it. 655 Sanctuary. Let's make this our prayer together as we stand up and sing this song together. We'll sing it twice with the piano and the third time a cappella. <laughs>